Um, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. And Miles, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. All right, Justin, thank you very much. And it is really a pleasure to be here. Um, Justin, you've done tremendous things for the, the technology community in the Twin Cities for a long time. So uh, I'm just thrilled to be a part of this. Um, so cool. So let's talk about uh, large data S-curves for construction project estimation and comparative analysis. I wanted to kind of do uh, a little bit of uh, early stuff um, to kind of get through some of this, just a little bit about me. So um, Miles Porter, I'm a lead data scientist with Trimble Incorporated. Um, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics from the University of Northern Colorado and an MS in Analytics uh, from Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, I work for Trimble. I'll talk a little bit more about what Trimble does, but just a little bit about me. I'm a musician. I have a cat and a dog and a, and a daughter and a son and a wife, and I do Taekwondo. So there, now you know all the interesting stuff about me. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Trimble just real quickly to kind of set the context. So I work in a group in Trimble called Trimble AI. We used to be called Trimble Central AI, but then we dropped the central. So we're now Trimble AI, because I guess that sounds cooler. Um, and what we do is we, we, in my group, work with different uh, business segments for Trimble Incorporated. So if you've ever been uh, by a construction site and you've seen people out with yellow poles and like a Frisbee thing on the top, that's Trimble. So we make a vast majority of those kinds of things. They're uh, GNSS or GPS location. They're super accurate and they're used for survey. That's the main thing that we do. But um, Trimble is a huge enterprise. So we, uh, I'll share some statistics here in a minute, but just some of these slides, some of these pictures on this slide give you an idea. We do stuff in rail, we do stuff in transportation and logistics. Um, kind of particularly proud of that, that little box there with the little, with the truck and the little red square. I have a patent on some stuff that was related to that. Um, we do stuff with agriculture. So path planning for uh, seeding and uh, spraying uh, fields. Um, we have a really cool division that uh, specializes in surveying the ocean floor. Um, haven't really worked much with them, but it's pretty cool. Um, we have a whole group that does uh, sort of like forensics for like accident scenes. Um, we do a lot of stuff in construction. We had um, some sort of fixed wing aerial survey equipment. We used to have our own drone division and then we sold it. And it was really a bummer because I was really hoping to get my hands on one of those drones, but it didn't happen. Um, and then we also do some stuff for the military. Actually, we do a significant amount of stuff for the military. So a lot of the, the, the Trimble GPS stuff is what um, you know, soldiers, soldier, soldiers will have on their wrists and in their vehicles and in aircraft and things like that. So. Uh, Trimble itself, um, it was founded in 1978 by Charlie Trimble. Um, our CEO is Rob Painter. Actually, the previous CEO is Steve um, Berglund. And the interesting thing about him is Steve Berglund went to high school in Robbinsdale here in the Twin Cities. Um, he graduated when he was like 16 and then he got like a, a PhD in chemical engineering or something, but he was actually from, from the hood, so, so we say. Um, we have 11,500 employees, over, a little over that in 30 countries, maybe 29 or 28 now, I'm not sure. Um, and we're part of the S&P 500 and our ticker symbol is TRMB. Um, so I used to have the uh, market cap on here, but let's just not talk about that right now. The stock market is pretty ugly. <laughs> so um, I threw this slide in here and I promise we'll get to ask hers, but I wanted to put this in here just to kind of give everybody the sense of where I'm coming from. So this may not work for you and that's totally cool with me. This is just kind of where my head is at. Um, when I think about things like AI and machine learning and operations research and probability and statistics and data science, to me, this is how they all kind of relate to each other. So I think of myself in the, in the realm of analytics and I kind of do everything in the yellow. Um, S-curves, as I get into this discussion, is kind of cool because it sits right at the center. It has some AI stuff in it. It has some simulation and operations research stuff in it. It has a lot of probability and statistics stuff in it. Uh, and we'll talk about those more. Um, the one thing that um, I struggle a little bit with is this term data science. 
Um, and for me, and this is just me, I mean, you're free to have your own, own opinion and you can think I'm completely goofy, but if you think about the scientific method and what that means, it's all about creating a hypothesis, conducting some experiments and capturing data, and then proving or disproving your original hypothesis. And from there, you sort of rinse and repeat. So in my mind, any kind of science is data science. Because if it isn't data science, what are you doing the science on? So then it becomes something else. So again, that's just my view. Um, the people that founded this, I, I think it's a couple of guys at Facebook and Twitter that came up with a term or maybe some folks at Gartner. But, um, but anyway, that's my definition. So like I said, feel free to make up your own if this doesn't work for you. And I, and I totally understand there are problems with this diagram. So um, I get that. Okay, so let's switch gears. So Tremble, as I mentioned, is this, this company that has its sort of various business segments, um, pretty big company. One of the business segments um, is focused specifically on construction project management. And that's our Trimble Viewpoint Division. And this is sort of their mission statement, transforming the construction industry with integrated construction accounting and project management software and solutions. So this was sort of the group that um, I started working with to, to try to explore this S-curves problem. And to sort of set the stage a little bit more, historically, construction um, profit margins range from eight to 3% or less. So it's a really, really tight business, right? And they wanna be as, as um, as good at it as they can, obviously, because they don't have a lot of room for error. So this is a real opportunity to be data driven, but it's a real industry that isn't um, in, in a lot of regards. So any kind of tools that Trimble can provide to help construction project managers do a better job of estimating their projects um, and understanding multiple projects and how they're working at the same time is really, really valuable to our, to our company and to our customers. So, this is the problem statement. So we want to be able to help our customers answer the questions of how are our projects running and is this project on track, right? And, you know, the holy grail is I'm 15% I'm into this construction project. What's my margin going to be? Now, uh, it's a scary thing because you don't know, um, but that's kind of what we're shooting for here. So we'll talk a little bit more about how we can get close to it. So now we're going to start to get mathy and we're going to start to get mathy really fast. So I know it's like Thursday night at 6.45. So you may want to grab another beer if you don't have one, but hang on, here we go. So construction projects should look like this. And what this is, is it's a graph of cost versus time. And we're going to see this over and over again in this presentation. Now the light gray line represents costs at a given point in time. And the black line represents cumulative costs. Now the black line has been scaled from zero to one. So this graph is usually zero to 100% for cumulative cost and starting time of zero to starting time of 100% done in the X axis. So a lot of the graphs I'm gonna to show tonight, except at the very end are gonna go from zero to one in both X and the Y axis. So the blue line here is an approximation to that black line. So it's tempting to think that that black line is like literally a continuous function mathematically, but it isn't. It's a collection of points that on day 36, we build a cumulative amount of $327,000. And on day you know, 287, it was $1,628,000 or something like that. So don't let the black line fool you. It's actually distinct points. And the blue line is a continuous function that approximates those distinct points. So we'll talk about how we get there. Now, I said construction projects should look like this. I'm not going to get into the proof of it, but I did want to make, make a point of this. It's a really well-known fact that construction projects should follow this S-curve shape. In fact, like this person, Wahid Uzair, has written a book on it that you can check out on the link here. Um, and I've seen um, P 
people that have done uh, in, in multiple text in construction management textbooks all the time, you'll see it where they'll actually simulate a construction project with a great big graph. And they'll show over time as you're doing the project because of dependencies, you end up getting this curve for cumulative cost. Now, it's not too hard to, to actually rationalize this. So think about a skyscraper. You're going to build a skyscraper and you're going to start off with a lot. OK, just a blank lot. Well, the first thing you're going to need to do is clear whatever is on there. So you have to demolish it and remove it. That's not terribly expensive. Right. You don't have a materials cost. You have to haul some things away. It doesn't take too many people to do it because it's, you know, it, anybody that's ever like torn down a shed knows it's it, it, it takes a lot longer to build one than it does to tear one down. So. In that initial phase, when you're just starting out, you don't have a lot of cost, but you reach a point where you start to accrue cost really pretty rapidly. And that's called the peak phase. And in that phase, you're doing things like you're putting up girders and you're, you know, you're, you're getting material on site and you have to have more people working and you have to manage them. So labor costs are higher. All of that kind of stuff is going on. That goes on for a while. And then at the end, you're doing things like putting on, you know, face plates for light switches and you're putting on the carpet, right? So those things at the, at the very end, you have to wait to the end, but they're not terribly expensive to do. And that's part of the reason for why this whole thing turns into this S, right? You can't make it a straight line. You can't paint the wall, put the drywall in, put the plumbing in under the wine, under the drywall and have the seventh floor already there all at the same time. It's just physically impossible. So that, that's part of why this S-curve happens. So enough about S-curves. So I mentioned this before. One of the things that we'd really like to do is take a construction project and, and figure out that S-curve. And if we could figure out that S-curve and describe it in just a couple of variables or a couple of values, we might be able to do some really cool stuff. We might be able to actually compare different construction projects on one graph or all the construction projects for a company on one graph. And we'll see how we do that in a second. But first thing we got to do is we got to figure out how do we get from those discrete points of cumulative cost over time to a line that, you know, that eventually, how do we fit a curve to that? So the first thing that we have to do, and this is a, this is a technique that was actually um, first explored by a guy named Kensley, and then another, um, another person, A.P. Kaka, uh, and then there have been several others, and I'll have a list of research, uh, references at the end that people can take a look at. Um, but this is not kind of a new thing, and it's also not the only way to do it. It's just sort of the way that I chose to do it here. Um, and the, the way that this approach works is you start off with your X, Y values, and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to perform a logit transformation on x and y. So logit is this function, the natural log of x over 1 minus x, right? So I'm just going to take my x values, and I'm going to plug them into this natural log function, and I'm going to get a new x value. And I'm basically just going to take my graph and transform it, and it'll take that s's, those dots that are in s's, and start to line them up. And once I've lined them up like that, then I can do a linear regression on that line. And, and once I have the linear regression, voila, I have my two variables that describe a project, and, uh, um, an, an alpha and a beta. The slope and the intercept of that line describes that line. And the nice thing about that logic function is I can do the inverse. I can take the natural log of x over 1 plus the, or sorry, e to the x over 1 plus e to the minus x. And I can do the inverse function. So that logit function has an inverse, and I can turn my straight line back into a curve again. All right. So it's a lot of crazy math stuff going on here, but uh, we're going to get into a little bit more about how it exactly works. But just to kind of give you this feel, so and I'll and I'll have another slide in, in a few slides that'll take you through this entire process of how things flow through. So. I'm going to take a moment to talk specifically about that ordinary least squares or that simple linear regression. So if you've ever um, studied this in math or statistics, um, or if you've had operations research, you've probably seen this before. Um, but I kind of wanted to go through the mathy part of this because I think this is 
this is part of data science that I tend to do. Um, not a lot, but I do it. I actually do do this. And I write these things out and give them to programmers and help them interpret it um, and implement it in code. Um, so I think it's kind of valuable to sort of see it. So what you have down here in the lower right hand corner is just some some toy data of dots and a line running through it. And I just put this in here to kind of reference it. So the Y, the XI and YI are the coordinates of the dots, the center of the dots. Now we have this thing called Y hat. And what that is, is that's if I went to the X value and I found the corresponding point right on the line. That's the estimation that our model produces. And you'll see this a lot in, in analytics. And if you look at sort of the, you know, if you look at the, um, uh, you know, books like this, applied linear regression, um, you'll see this kind of notation sitting in there quite a bit. Um, but what we're gonna wanna try to do is we're gonna sum up all of that error and try to make it as small as possible. So that's really what a regression problem turns into. It's actually an optimization problem. And when it becomes an optimization problem, it becomes a machine learning problem because that is a machine learning algorithm. So, um, or the linear regression is a machine learning algorithm. So as I just mentioned, the best fit line is gonna be Y hat I equals B zero plus B one X. This is just Y equals MX plus B, right? It's just written with some different letters. And what we want to do is we want to find B0 and B1 such that this thing, Q, is a minimum. So don't let this freak you out. It just means my actual data minus my guess squared summed up for all my points. I just want that to be a minimum. And the reason we squared is that if I didn't square it, it would, it would sum to zero because we have some we have half the points below the line and half the points above the line or half the error below the line and half the error above the line, okay? Now, now we get to do some fun little math um, things that you probably remember from high school. Well, you know, look, here's a YI and up here I have YI, I can just substitute in B0 plus B1X to get this thing yi minus b0 minus b1 xi squared, the sum for i equals one to n, that's my error function and I wanna minimize that. So if you remember from calculus, how do you do the minimum? You take the first derivative and you set it equal to zero. You set the slope equal to zero because the idea is it's a, it's a curve. We're just dealing with a, a parabola here. It's just the point at the curve on the parabola where you flatten out. Now, if we were really, Persnickety, we do the second derivative and show that it was positive, but we're not going to go that far. Um, in fact, I'm not even going to go any farther than this, other than to say, if you take this thing and take the derivative with respect to B1, you can show that it equals this. And now we have a new character in this equation, this X bar thing. That just means the average of all the Xs. It's just the mean of the Xs. So this is saying that the, the slope of the regression line is the sum of the, the points minus the mean for X and Y over the sum of the X minus the mean squared. And if you can calculate that, boom, you, you figured out the slope of your regression line and B0, you just plug it into this equation and you got B0. So Y is just, Y bar is just the average of the Ys. And we already talked about X bar is the average of the Xs. So to kind of help illustrate this, this a little bit, we've already seen one before. Here's a big one. Now this is one that I, going back to that logistics regression thing, or excuse me, the logic function, that I did all of the steps here. So I took the, cum each circle is, was originally the cumulative cost and the time scaled from zero to one. I then plugged it into that, the X and Y values and plugged them into that logit function. And lo and behold, they sort of dance right around this line. And then I used, um, and then I just compute, actually I did it in R here. I usually use Python, but for this thing I did R. Um, and I just computed this red line here, which is the, linear regression. 
So as if that were not enough, I'm gonna go a little bit further because this is fun, but the really cool thing about regression is that if you can show certain characteristics of your points, you can start to build confidence intervals about that line. And that's pretty cool, particularly over here at the end, if I can get confidence intervals at the end, because then I can go back to the customers and say, hey, I know based on your data that there is, you know, a 20% of the time, your error is going to fall between these two values. And that would be really exciting for our customers. But as I said, in order for that to work, the, 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 the points that I'm fitting this regression line to have to have some statistical properties. And more specifically, the error between the points and the regression line, and that's called the residuals. So if you ever hear about um, uh, analysis, uh, regression analysis, this is regression analysis. So there's uh, the main thing that we want to see here that we're interested in right now um, is that those residuals are distributed in a bell curve. So if you just sort of figured out what their values were and you graphed them in a histogram, if you remember from probability and statistics, that they would have a normal probability. Now, right here I can see, I'm just gonna sort of show you some of this output in R, that my intercept was this and my slope was this. And this thing over here, this, uh, uh, less than 2e to the minus 16 power. This is actually a t-test, a statistical t-test. And the statistical t-test is comparing this value with zero, right? So if, if this value actually is uh, less than zero, it means I can be really confident that I actually have a, an intercept and a slope that are non-zero. They're actually these values, which is really cool. And if I have this normal distribution, I can also estimate confidence intervals about these, this slope and this intercept, which is confidence intervals about that line. The only problem is we don't have a normal distribution here, which sucks, which means this is not terribly reliable, um, but it really means that I can't quit now and go to my go to my construction customers and say, I just did a little statistics trick and I know that you know, you're gonna have this confidence, right? Which is a little bit of a bummer, but- oh, Yeah, Miles? Yeah. Yeah, I was just kind of curious. If you flip back two slides, um, are, are we starting to see the shape of an S curve in here with all these black lines, with all these black dots? What you're seeing is the, the, this function trying to pull that out trying to flatten it out as much as possible. I see, okay. Um, I don't have the graph in here for what it looked like before, but we, oh, I will in a minute. So okay. I'll show you in a minute. Cool. Um, back to the confidence interval thing, that doesn't work yet, but we'll have a tool to do that. And that's what we're gonna talk about in stochastic simulation. So I think this will help answer your question, Justin. So. This upper left-hand corner, this is the raw data. So this is on these days, the duration of the project, how much cost was incurred on those given days. And some days have zero. And, and when a day doesn't have a cost, we just ignore it. What I did then was I took that data and created this cumulative cost graph, right? And this is what's trying to be an S. Now, this is the thing. In an ideal construction project, yes, it looks like an S-curve. The problem is they don't look like S-curves enough, um, or that's the opportunity for improvement, right? So if I take this thing and perform my double logic function, I kind of start to squeeze that S into more of a straight line. And then that's how I can fit this line into that regression, that do that linear regression. And then, if I want to, I can take the line and do that inverse function of e to the x over one plus e to the x of my y and x values, and I'll get the curve back, and we end up fitting a curve to the line. Okay, so I'm going to take a break, a, a sip of water here, and let you absorb this. If you only get one thing out of this, the most important thing is that we can take the, the sort of that 
profile of that project and we can describe it in two values, in a slope and an intercept, right? That core, that alpha and that beta, or that B0 and B1, that correspond to that project. And each project will have their own, okay? Now, if I were to take one construction company over a two year period and do this for every construction job that they had, what would it look like? It would look like this which is kind of cool. So now, now I think maybe you'll start to see some of the potentials here. So if we go back to the original goal for our, for our discussion, our original um, you know, sort of the problem statement, the first, the first one was how well are my projects running? And it kind of implied in that, how do they compare to each other? And that you can kind of see that on this graph. So if you see a dot over to the right, it, mean, it means that there was a project that just sort of chugged along, didn't incur a lot of cost, and then at the very end, ramped up like mad in a, in a mad dash to the end. Sounds if like a see, software project. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it could be. And then if you have another one over here, this sounds like some of the projects, like I recently had some flooring put in my house. This is the flooring project for my house where it took off like mad, and they just couldn't get the dang thing done. We had like one nose piece that was like hanging out forever, right? So that's that. If the project is at the top, it's like nothing happened. Then you went absolutely insanely crazy. And then it was just like flat until it was finally over. And then, you know, if it's at the bottom, this is really bad. This is like, it took off really fast. And then it didn't do much. And then it had a mad dash at the end. So this is sort of like the inverted S curve. So you really don't want to have these things at the bottom. Now, you can do all kinds of really cool stuff with this. I've color coded these in terms of the color of the color, meaning the dark blue, meaning that was a, a fairly low cost project to, to bright red as a really high cost project. But you can also do other things like color the dots related to who the project manager was, color the dots related to where the project was in terms of geographic region, if you wanted to kind of do that, um, you know, or, or sort of say projects in this zip code have this color and projects in this zip code have this color. Some of these companies do all kinds of different kind of work, right? So maybe some of this stuff is commercial buildings and some of it is, um, you know, uh, residential and some of it is like retail and there's a lot of companies that use our products that do um, paving and road work so maybe some of it is airport runways some of it is highways some of it is you know things like that so you can organize them that way and then the thing that i think is really cool is that there's an implied fourth dimension here these projects kicked off at a certain point in time right, or closed at a certain point in time. And you could animate this graph and display the projects as they occurred over time and start to see, oh, did I start here? And then I started to drift up this way? What would that mean? It could potentially mean my projects are starting to drag on and on and on and on longer and longer. Is that an indication of some supply chain problems or something else going on? So that's kind of the kind of the cool. So this is actually from one of our customers um, where we went and actually pulled this data. And the sweet spot, incidentally, is right in the middle there somewhere. And it's kind of interesting how the, I kind of like to think about the distribution of that. So, so is, is a lot of this stuff more or less like kind of risk analysis, I guess, you know, going in, understanding all the possible variables and making sure that you can get as close to ideal as possible, knowing what's happened in the past. Kind of, yeah. And it's also kind of, yeah. So it's kind of like, it's almost kind of a Bayesian take on some of this stuff. And we'll see that in a little bit. So, you know, the Bayesian statistics is sort of like the probability of A given B equals the probability of B given A times the probability of A over the probability of B. But it's sort of like, how does the past inform the future? How does your statistical prior inform your, you know, your next best guess kind of thing? Yeah. And we'll see that. We'll actually see that in a graph coming up at the very end. It's sort of the, the, the 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 the, the sixty four thousand dollar question. I wanted to sort of mention this because one of the things that we tried to do, and this was this was interesting. So if I just have one project, like I mentioned, not all projects are the same, but some projects are similar, right? 
So if I just had one project, how could I compare it with other projects? Um, and one way to do that is to kind of create this idea of a metric where you say, okay, here's a project. It was in this location. It was this kind of project. It had this dollar amount. It started in this month, um, blah, blah, blah. And you sort of do this nearest neighbor thing based on different properties of that project. And what we did here, this is actually based on some work that AP Kaka did. And he said, he didn't have huge amounts of project data. He was just you know, one poor research guy at Cambridge. And he was able to go out and get like five or 10 projects. And he said, well, what I could do is I could take those five or 10 projects and then I could compute the alphas and the betas for those five or 10 projects. And then I could just assume that the alphas and the betas individually are distributed with a normal distribution, a Gaussian bell curve. And if I have 10 values, then I can say, okay, here's the mean for those 10, and here's the standard deviation for those 10. And now I can create this normal random variable. And essentially what I'm doing is, I, as I'm saying, create me in this image here, create me 10,000 projects that are similar to these things. And in those 10,000 projects, go off and kind of find what the average one looked like. And now let's use that to say, okay, how am I doing compared to how I'm doing st stochastically for an average, right? And that's what this red line is, is it's not the best fit curve to the black, it's sort of fitting in in the middle of that morass of gray stuff. So, oops, wrong button. So that was the idea. The reality is, well, hey, we're Trimble Viewpoint. We've got thousands of customers, tens of thousands of jobs. I mean, we looked at three customers. We had some, I don't know, over 10,000 construction jobs for just three customers, right? So, well, big data hit. I mean, why try to do the stochastic simulation? We could just yank everything. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. So on the left-hand side, I used this project and then did a stochastic simulation based off of similar kinds of projects. Not a great fit. But over here on the right hand side, I just said, okay, forget it. I'm just going to do a, I'm just going to go grab every single project and see how the S curves for all of those projects line up. And the way that you sort of fit this curve is you say, imagine hundreds of these little S curves, right? sort of stack them up and then line up a line vertically and say, okay, find me the point where, you know, 90% of these S's of these dotted lines are between for all of this company. And then similarly, 60, 40, 20, and 10. So this is sort of like, this is kind of what you're shooting for. This is, this is kind of your, um, well, I don't want to say shooting for, but this is, this is sort of, this is par for your company right? It's what's in between the blues. So if you're somewhere out of that, that can kind of give you a feel during a project, what's going on, or better yet, after the project is over to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more retrospective about things. Okay. I got a quick question, Miles. Yeah. Are, are companies looking at this in real time and trying to adjust, you know, as you're getting 30% of the way through, Okay, like, I guess what dials do they have? Or are you guys kind of helping them figure out like what the next project should look like, you know, for them? I'm just, just curious yeah, you know, how, how we applying this data is to them. Yeah. So in, in all transparency, I'm not sure yet. So we are in sort of beta mode with our customers right now, letting them play with this and get a feel for it. Um, the other thing that we're really trying to do and, and it, you know, if I had absolutely exact data, this would be easy. But there's no research. There's you know there's no PhD student or master's student TA or somebody sitting there on the construction type taking copious notes. We are relying on the construction project managers themselves to enter their data in as precisely as they as they can. Now they have an incentive to do that, and that is that they use our system to do tax reporting. Um, and tracking. So it doesn't behoove them to, to be bad. But at the same time, you know, their job is not to fill out our forms on our software. Their job is to build the damn building. 
Sure. So sometimes the quality is a little bit lacking. So I think we're still kind of navigating some of that to try to figure out how to get it through. But I can show you where I think this is going to go and, and how I think it will be helpful. I, again, I think it's, it's useful to the construction company when I've talked to them and shown them this stuff in the past. They've been really excited about, oh, wow, you know, I didn't realize it was this spread out. I thought we always did everything just exactly right. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they were also like, oh, we want to be getting in here and playing with stuff. Um, and so we'll see. We'll see. So the jury's out on that. Sounds Question, good. Miles? Am yeah. Yeah, this is Jim. Fascinating stuff here. Um, so as, as the project managers are putting their estimates together, right, there's a series of tasks with critical paths and so on. Mm -hmm. And depending on how they think about um, Slack, right? They, they want to leave some kind of buffer uh, for those tasks. And, and typically they, they tend to piecemeal the buffer out across each task. But as you get into the execution of the project, if you don't, if you burn the total amount of slack too early, you never get it back, right? So it's right. almost like your curve shifts to the, to the left. Yeah. So one of the things, and I think you bring up a really good point here, is that the projects themselves are not static. And we're starting to kind of get into this. There's this concept that we have of a change order. And it doesn't take very, it isn't very hard to see where those happen in these projects. Like this might have been one, this might have been one, where you rescope the project essentially, right? So you say, okay, now I got to this point in the project. Okay, oh, we got to do something else. Now I'm going to have to add more cost. I'm going to, you know, it's going to cost the, 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 the customer more. It's going to take me more time to do it. And that's kind of going to start to mess with the S curves, right? Because if you're up to a point where you thought you were almost done and then you're like, oh man, now I got to change a whole bunch of stuff. You may start another S curve there too. So that's another thing that I think is here. We haven't explored that yet, but you're absolutely right. I mean, Slack and the individual items. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of things that can adjust these curves left and right. The hope though, is that in the aggregate, we might be able to kind of provide them with some information that will help them assess everything overall, right? I kind of answer your question. Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. So let's go here. So why do we care? So I think this is now starting to kind of get into this, the Justin's question of, okay, this is great, but why do we care? So let's imagine that we have a construction project um, and we knew what that, that, whatever that normal thing is, and we have a project in flight and that project is say 24% complete. So I actually kind of know this because the project managers put in a date that they thought the project was going to be done with, right? I know that date. I know how much time has elapsed since then. And I know how much money they've spent so far. So if I know that they've spent 25% so far, I can start to go, oh, okay, well, if you spent you know, 25 bucks and I know $25,000 and you're 25% done with your project, then you're going to be a hundred thousand dollar project. Right. And this is where it gets interesting. If I can start to build those confidence intervals, because now I can say, okay, at this point in the project, if I go up to that confidence curve, go over here and then do that little sort of take your current burn rate divided by this percentage, I can get an estimate of where you're going to be at the end. So it's kind of cool. They love the cost thing. It's also interesting that you can go the other way. If you know how much you've spent and you know what your final budget is, then I can tell you, you should be this much done. And if I know how many days have elapsed, I can tell you what the date is that you should finish. That's pretty cool. So now we can start to do the crystal ball. And this makes me nervous as hell. <laughs> So this is the prediction. Of course, you know, I couldn't do a thing without having a quote from Rush. So a planet of play things, we dance on the strings of powers we cannot perceive. Um, 
I, I worked on a construction project in high school. There was a uh, building called uh, Republic Plaza in Denver, and I helped build this steel staircase that went between a couple of floors in that building. And you know, I, I was a I was a nobody. I carried heavy things. I, I didn't weld or do anything like that. But it was really enlightening to sort of be part of that because it made me realize how much you don't know when you do these construction projects, right? They just change all the time, and it it's really, really a tricky business to try to get in and uh, sort of predict these things. So I realize I'm treading into shark infested waters here, um, holding a stake in each hand, but okay, we'll go for it. So this is kind of what I was talking about, Justin, when you had answered your question. So if I know that my project has gone up to this point and I know that I've burned a certain amount of cost at this point, and I know that I have these probabilities, I mean, these, these contour lines, then I can start to draw this stuff out to say, okay, I'm 90% sure your project's gonna run into here. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 60% sure it's gonna be here, right? So this is encouraging. Um, and I can sort of communicate this back to the customer. So this is the holy grail right here, right? Um, and it, mathematically, by the way, this is a really fascinating thing because you'd think, at, at least I did, I looked at this graph and I was like, what the heck? But it's cool. This top line actually equates to this bottom line over here. It does a flip thing because if you think about it, if I'm 50% through my project, I don't have very much more to go before I've used up all of my cost. Well, that would be this bottom line. But if I'm 50% and I've only used a tiny portion, I've got to start to really burn a lot of stuff to get to the end. And that's the top line. So I thought that was kind of cool. Mathematically, it does that little flip thing. And it's because you divide your current uh, burn rate by this probability or yeah, your current cumulative cost by this percent complete to get the final cost. So that's kind of cool it that it does that. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah one over the value one yeah the, the yeah percentage. there's some there's some really interesting things by the way that happen in here mathematically i won't i won't bug you too much but um we have real real problems at zero and one because of that logit function it's the natural log of one over one minus x so if the value oh, sorry the natural log of x over one minus x so if if let me go back this is I, this is important. Well, mathematically, this is interesting. Here, if 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 x is time, if we're at zero time, what happens here? You get zero over one minus zero, which is zero. Okay, you can't take the natural log of zero. It blows up. And if you're at hundred percent time, you get one over zero. It blows up immediately. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the challenge of this mathematical function. And the way that we handle it here is we just, we don't deal with zero and we don't deal with one. <laughs> we just start 1% to 99% and, you know, it, so anyway, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah. Get some approximations as close to it as you can. It's like you said, it's kind of dividing by zero. It just goes to infinity. Yeah. And, and you don't care you don't care before zero because the project started at some time. And once you're at 99%, you probably don't even care anyway. So you're almost done anyway. So, so let's talk a little bit more. Now I'm going to sort of delve into that ML ops -ish. I don't know if I want to say that, but let's talk about how we actually, actually implemented this application because I think it's, it might be interesting for some folks. So we're actually dealing with some pretty sizable data here. So as I mentioned, we have three companies, that's 76,000 construction projects, that's 2.3 million, 2 million costs that we have to aggregate um, for those 76,000 construction projects. So obviously we're not gonna, don't really wanna do this on the server. Um, and this is a great, uh, a great application for something like uh, Spark which is actually what we use. So we use Databricks and it allows us to, in this case, do the over 2.3 million cost calculations in 15 seconds, which is just really nice. And then the way we handle this, I'm just, here you go. Here's my architecture diagram. 
Um, so we use Snowflake and Viewpoint as the data mine, sort of the, the data warehouse. And we use Databricks on a, on a weekly basis or whenever we want to extract the data for the construction companies, the costs, and we do actually the, um, the regression for all of those projects in Databricks using the machine learning functionality in Databricks. And we save that stuff out into a SQL Server database in Azure. And then we're using the Azure Key Vault to store a whole bunch of secrets and an Azure web app to then deliver up some views that are created. They're basically just web page views um, that, that have been uh, animated with D3 um, to give the visualizations. So there are primarily three views. There's a micro view, which is that individual project. There's a macro view, which is the whole thing. And then there's the unfinished project view. So I'll go in here and sort of show you what those look like. So these are screens from the prototype application. Um, I would actually like try to run a web browser and hit it, but I know it would crash. So I'm not gonna even try <laughs> was running fine today, but it's just the kiss of death. You try to do a live demo and it's just not going to work. Um, but this is the this is the screen for if I log in and I'm, I'm, I am this customer, I'm, I'm Enterprise 172, that would be a Trimble customer. These are actual dots that are corresponding to that project. The size of the dot in this uh, sort of um, manifestation of this screen represents the magnitude of that project based on the original project estimate, not the final cost, but what they originally thought. The color is the actual project manager, which is kind of interesting. You see a bunch of greens in here for, for this project manager, a bunch of purples over here uh, or reds over here. You know, the, the apparently there's some project managers that are, you know, dealing in some big stuff, but no real earth shattering sort of realizations here. Um, you can also click on a play button and it'll play the dots as they appear and you can sort of see them start in the middle and then sort of spread out over time, which is kind of interesting. So RMSE is root mean squared error. And if you recall, each one of these dots has a regression applied to it. And that regression has an error. It's not perfect. And so you could color code these things and know which projects did we do a good job of, of modeling the S and which projects did we kind of not do such a good job of? And then these last two are sort of duplicates. It's just uh, how much profit did we have? And then what was the profit margin for that individual project? So that's the macro view. And from here, I can click on an individual project or I can enter a project ID number over here and click submit, or I can look at jobs that aren't done yet. And this is if I look at a specific job, this is gonna look kind of familiar, right? So here, the dotted lines in this graph are from all of the jobs for this company over a given time period. The, the jaggedy lines on this graph are when I did that stochastic simulation. So I found like 10 projects that were similar. And then based on the mean and standard deviation of the S curve, I, I generated a whole bunch of random ones and then figured out what their distributions were from the stochastic nature. And then the dotted line is sort of the normalized S curve for this project. And then the black line is the actual project itself. Um, and you can turn the, the colors on and off. Uh, and then I should mention, I gray, I sort of redacted here um, the information. If you were an actual customer, you could actually see the, the job description and you could see the name the name of the project manager, the city and the state, so on and so forth. And then this is kind of the, um, the holy grail. So this is one that we sort of saw a little bit before, but if I'm at a certain point in my project and I'm pretty confident that I'm, you know, 58% complete, where am I going to end up? And then we give them that information down here. And that's kind of, the deal. So, you know, I think going forward, what are we looking at? Well, we understand that um, change orders in a project can really affect the S curve. So, we're looking at ways to implement those change orders as part of this process. Um, and then just sort of iterating back and forth with our customers and saying, hey, did you get any value out of this? What would make this more meaningful, more valuable to you? Um, is sort of where we're headed now. And here are all of those different references. So, 
13, this Kinsley and Wilson from 1986, the construction project cash flow model and ideo, an ideographic approach. This is probably the big one. And then this um, AP COCA, the development of a benchmark model, it uses historical data for monitoring the projects of current construction projects. That one is the big one too that we use. So, you know, I guess I'm saying don't blame me, blame these days. They came up with the idea. What we did, what we did is we basically said, well, you don't need to do stochastic simulation. We already have 2000 projects. Why, why would we need to simulate 2000 projects? So, um, yeah, so I think that's kind of, that's kind of the deal. Uh, do you think, so due to the fact of the number of projects you have, are you at a point now where you can start making these predictions? For example, like, you know, back in the eighties, was it still hypothetical because they didn't have enough data? Yeah, I think that's I think that's probably right. I think I think we're reaching a point now to where the data quality is on, only going to get better. So one of the things that Trimble does is we not only provide the software to the construction company, we also have we also have devices that are running in all of the construction equipment. We have, you know, some of the other projects that I'm working on, we have cameras and microphones that are monitoring the construction site to keep track of activity. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff there to sort of figure out what's going on on that construction site. So I think that cost curve could be replaced by an activity curve um, if we could figure out how to do that. And then that would have all kinds of, I think, really important implications. One of, one of which is maybe, maybe a little overlooked, but hugely relevant. There's tons of literature that talks about why S curves happen and why you need to kind of do a project in an S curve. If you're not in that S curve shape, an ideal S curve, you're not being efficient. And if you're not being efficient, you know, you get into the sustainability questions. So that's another huge thing for Trimble um, and for our customers. They're very concerned about, am I, am I doing my job in a, in a sustainable way? Um, and it's, it's, is it altruistic? Well, not really. I mean, doing sustainable construction is, is the most profitable construction, right? Otherwise, you're wasting money and you're wasting time. Um, so I, it, anyway, there's a whole sustainability thing here. I guess my point is there's all kinds of momentum pushing on the construction companies to be more accurate and gather more data about this stuff. And I think, you know, sort of the big data movement is so much here now. Um, I mean, we just even saw it in the number of costs that we get, but you can imagine if we have, we have a, we have a device called a total station that is basically a camera that can sit and scan a construction site. It can also do a 3D point cloud, right? So it can monitor the actual structure of that construction site as it's going on. The amount of data that thing captures is just enormous, right? Point clouds are gigantic, right? So if we could harness that, once we start to harness that and feed that into a model like this, I think we're going to get even more and more and more accurate. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that that will happen. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of the questions I was thinking of was, does this S curve follow other things besides construction projects? Because it seems to seems like it could apply to a lot of other things, even. I was just and I was jokingly saying software projects, but I mean, you know, you, it, things could follow that same sort of curve. Would would you agree? Or yeah. you looking at other areas. Yeah, no, it totally it totally does agree. We're we're not applying this to other areas, um, but it potentially could be applied. Construct. I mean, and if you think about it, I, I'm sure there's some way to maybe go in and look at like Jira or something, right? Mm -hmm. And figure yeah. out how to apply this to an agile project. Um, but yeah, I mean, anybody that's ever worked on an agile construction, you know, agile software project knows you kind of start off slow and then you have this crazy ramp up period. And then towards the end, you're sort of getting into maintenance mode and, you know, so then things kind of slow down. So yeah, sure. And it, it's, that's part of, part of what the PMI talks about too. If you, if you sort of Google the PMI escrow stuff, it's not just construction, it's all kinds of different projects. So software being one and. I mean, I'm sure there are others out there too. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, cool. Um, so yeah. other questions? 
Well, I just wanted to go back to this slide because and I hope maybe people hear this slide. So and, and this is the AI group. And 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 I wanted to just sort of mention, you know, that artificial intelligence stuff. Um, it, it is here. It, it is in how we do that, the regression fit to the line. And I talked about the, the uh, discrete way, sort of the closed form way of doing that, where you take the derivative. There are other methods in here that use other machine learning pro, um, techniques. Some of them actually may be a little faster, and they use things like maximum likelihood estimators and some other kind of um, sort of statistical machine learning techniques to get at the, the means, but some of that is in here. Um, I do other work in this area, but this just happened to be kind of the project that I'm working on. And then we talked about operations research. So simulation was a big part of what we do in here. And then talked a little bit about the probability and the statistics parts. Like we can't just do a statistical analysis on the construction costs and then go back to the customers and say, oh, well, we don't have to do any more work. We need to go a little bit further because those residuals aren't distributed normally. Um, so that's all probability and statistics stuff down here. So I just kind of wanted to revisit this and sort of bring this back home to folks. And I don't know, feel free to adopt this if, if you like it. If you don't, like I said, create your own. Could you could you see some unsupervised learning, especially in all this video? I mean, that's what I was thinking of was just like all the data coming over around the construction project and the image analysis of it and you don't even know what the relationships are and that's the beauty of sort of unsupervised learning well you know learning is that we throw a whole bunch of things through the model and see if you know maybe there's some information in there that we can't even see that ends up adjusting the weights yeah i think for some of the unsupervised learning stuff where i see a real uh, benefit for that is in doing clustering algorithms so to me you know and and i I do a lot of stuff with deep learning and, and neural nets, but from, from just sort of the more general uh, machine learning perspective, to me, a, a machine, when you do an unsupervised learning, it's sort of like you don't have ground truth. You don't know what ground truth is. You have a bunch of X's, but you don't have any Y's, right? And what machine learning is going to do is, in the way that I think of it, is it's going to take those X's and like cluster them together into, into like some kind of optimal clustering. So that could potentially play in here. I think one of the things that could be really interesting is this self-supervised learning stuff, because you can you start to use transformers and some other techniques to do like semantic, well, sort of segmentation of the data. So if you can imagine going back to that image, right, using transformers to be able to classify certain things in the image or identify similar things in the image might be potentially valuable. Um, particularly around um, trying to figure out using that as, in, in other words, if we can get away from cost and reported cost, and we can rely on something that we can ourselves observe, the accuracy might be a little bit better. Um, and interestingly enough, the solution gets way more expensive, but I don't know, maybe that's okay. Yeah. One of the yeah. things that, one of the things I'm really interested in is trying to use acoustic information on a construction site and feeding that in, because even if you just had volume, right? Think about the construction site. If if um, once you get a lot of stuff happening, now demolition probably makes a lot of noise, and that isn't probably as valuable, but. As the project ramps up it's going to get louder and then as it tails off at the end it's going to get quieter. If you could use that as a surrogate for cost or activity, that's kind of interesting too. So, but I'm I, that's one of my other projects is a uh, acoustic sort of like computer listening. You know, you have computer vision problems. This is more yeah. of a computer listening problem. So I don't know. We'll see where that one goes. Maybe, maybe in a year I can come back and talk about that one if you guys will invite me back. Yeah. No. <laughs> You that sounds cool. Yeah, I haven't just... been 86 from the group. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure not. Yeah, no, I was just thinking, is there a beacon somebody could wear on, on themselves as they're there? You know, maybe in a helmet, for example, right? Every helmet has something on it. So then you could obviously track them through, you know, RF. And then you just know how many headcount, you know, are there. And like you said, if there's more people, then there's probably more activity and probably more burn to the, to the cost. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, turnstile through the, you know, you can just count people as they go through the turnstile onto the site. We've, sure. we've done some work with that too, with like one of the interesting projects that we had was as people are coming through the turnstile, we had a camera there and it did uh, classification, um, object detection and classification. And we were looking for hard hats and safety vests. And if you walk through and you didn't have a hard hat or a vest on, it would alert you. So, you know, if we can do that, I think certainly we can count people coming through. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one, one, one thought that I had here was, um, uh, are, are these projects fixed costs? You, you mentioned a little bit about a change order, but I mean, I, I would imagine that if your upper threshold now all of a sudden goes up by a million dollars because they've approved some change, does that throw off your algorithms? Oh, now? totally. Yeah, yeah, it totally would. And I think it changes the scope of the project. And so you, I think what would happen is you would enter into a new S curve. And so one of the things that I'd like to be able to do is take this approach and say, okay, now looking back at the data, let's divide up this project into little S curves that fit between the change orders and see how that fits um, and sort of do it like a, you know, we talk about a cubic spline for, for fitting curves. This would be sort of a, an S curve spline for construction projects. And it'll be interesting to see. I haven't had enough time to, to kind of dive into that research, but that would be kind of a, a cool thing to explore. The other part, though, I got to tell you, in looking at this data, it, it's, it's kind of scary from the dates and, and the data quality. So we'd have to really partner with one of, our, one of our customers and say, hey, if you really want to get this kind of insight, you're going to have to do your part and really enter in accurate data um, because otherwise... You know, you'd be amazed how many like cost dates I have in the database that are like, you know, five years from today. I mean, how does that yeah. happen? Yeah, just so, centered. Yeah. yeah. And I can't, you, you can't, you know, I got to depend on the actual time of the cost. That's how the S curves work. So, yeah. Data quality, can't get away from it. <laughs> For sure. Well, any any other questions from the group here? People free to feel free to unmute. I didn't see any um, messages here in the chat. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Just thank you very much, Miles. This is absolutely fantastic topic, and I like the way you broke it down. And looking forward Thanks. to digging into it more. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, if if anybody has any questions or anything, you know, feel free to send me an email or reach out on LinkedIn or whatever. And I'm more than happy to chat about this stuff. Um, and I, I'm sort of a late comer to this group and I'm really looking forward to kind of the next presentation you have next week about uh, um, sort of, what, what did you say, sculpting data for, for uh, machine learning? That's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. So <laughs> yes. feature engineering, yeah, that kind of stuff is very cool. All right. Well, great. So if there's no other comments right now, so we'll let everyone uh, sign off, but we're getting a lot of thank yous here in the chat. And again, um, I posted a link to the podcast. So if people have uh, a chance to subscribe to the podcast, my conversation with Miles will be out here in a couple of weeks. And we talk about a lot of this stuff, but a lot of other stuff too, as well. So um, thanks again, Miles. I appreciate it. And uh, look forward to having you back for sure, either just attending a future uh, meetup. Um, or I'm um, presenting as well. Again, right. some of your findings. This is uh, really, really cool. Right on. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I really, really appreciate it. It was great to chat to everybody.